Hello everyone, my name is Mark Brown and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to produce a relatively short video talking about policy. Well, more specifically talking about policy related to digital education. I'm gonna try and cover five sort of questions, but actually the bulk of my time is going to be talking about what is policy. But I also do want to get to questions four and five, because some of you, I hope, will have an interest in doing some policy research. Um, I have a doctoral student currently working in this area and have previously supervised students um, working in the policy space, if you like. So let's ask ourselves, what is policy? Hopefully you'll get the chance to have a conversation about this amongst yourselves um, and with your um, course facilitators. But uh, policy is actually a very difficult thing to define. It's certainly not a simple matter. In fact, there isn't really an all-inclusive definition of the term public policy in the literature. I'm going to help try to articulate some various definitions of policy, but it's fair to say that some of the definitions that you might be presented with are actually quite narrow, um, particularly where it's just focusing on the policy documents. Um, and Foucault is one that certainly would argue that position. Let me um, give you at least one of the better known theorists working in the policy area, Stephen Ball, who identifies two particular types of, or forms of policy. The first I've already referred to, really, policy texts. These are the policy documents. But what we mean by a policy document is not quite as straightforward as it might sound either. So I'm going to give some examples. Firstly, it's helpful, I think, when you're looking at these policy texts to think about big P policy texts and small P policy texts. So let's have a look. What's a big P policy text in the context of digital education? I'm going to use examples from primarily higher education, which is the area I'm more familiar with in recent years. This comes from the National Forum, and it's essentially a national strategy for digital learning, building digital capacity from 2013 to 2018. Um, this went through a consultation process, and the outcome was this um, document. Now, I think I referred to it as a strategy. We'll call it a policy text, to use the language that we would as a, a researcher working in this area. But whether it's a strategy, a roadmap, a blueprint, all of these terms could be used, and they all fall under the definition of a policy text. This one, of course, big P policy text. Here's an example of a smaller P policy text, and maybe there are variations in the sizes of the P's here, if you like, but this one is a document that did an analysis of various policies around the world in digital education, again by the National Forum, um, but this wasn't itself a document that then concluded with a policy for a big P policy for Ireland. So it's a document preparing the policy environment or the landscape to think about big P policies, but it really fits more for me the definition of a small P policy. Okay, let's see if we can take it down a little further here. A few years ago, um, actually during the COVID crisis when um, the survey was released by the National Forum on how students and staff experience digital learning. Um, at the time, not only did the National Forum release the, the report, which probably counts as survey research, this report actually was about how they went about doing the study. Um, so therefore, it's more of a policy text. And actually, I've corrupted it a little bit in terms of what I've put on the screen, because the Minister of Education at the time also released a press release to go with the index survey. That press release actually counts as a small p policy text. So all of the documents, the policy texts around the policy environment really fit the definition of a policy text. It's probably also helpful to make a distinction here that policy, big p policy, and then all those little p policies that go with it, 
operate at a sort of supranational macro level, a meso national level, an institutional level, and I'm calling it a nano level within institutions. There are policy texts as well. Or if you're coming from a schooling environment or a workplace learning environment, the same sort of hierarchical thinking applies here. What's very interesting is, of course, the interface or alignment between these levels. Um, that's a very interesting area for research, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I need to give you a little bit more about policy. In recent times, a very interesting type of policy has emerged. So there are various definitions and sub-definitions of policy. I'm not going to go into great detail, but this is a very interesting one. It's called nudge policy. It's actually quite controversial. Um, I can't give you great examples of nudge policy in digital education, but one of the ones that's best cited uh, around nudge policy is in relation to donating blood. Um, if you were to have a traffic accident and sadly pass away, or just if you have recorded on your driver's license, as many countries do, whether you're willing to be a donor, um, an organ donor. Um, so normally, the policy here would be that you would have to opt in in order to do so. Nudge policy is where actually they switch the policy so that you have to opt out. And countries that have done just that have had a dramatic increase in or significant increase in the number of people who are now prepared to be organ donors um, in tragic circumstances, sadly. I hope that kind of resonates and maybe my challenge for you, because there are examples of nudge policy, um, in digital education is to try to think of a nudge policy, whether that's in your own institution, uh, maybe around assessment of some kind, things that are trying to encourage and get a behavioral change. It's controversial for that reason, because it can be seen as quite manipulative. But I'm just giving you a sense of policymakers have learned that top-down big P policies generally struggle to be implemented for various reasons. We'll touch on some of those reasons shortly. And this nudge policy has emerged as a way of being a slightly more subtle about getting the policy implemented and actioned in the way that politicians and policymakers may wish. Haven't quite finished because it's also important, and I've alluded to this, that policy is also a process. Now, too often we just think of people um, when they're doing research in this area, focusing on the big P or the small P policies, and they overlook the importance of understanding how the policy was developed, who was involved in the development, what time frame, what number of iterations did it go through? Was it um, shared publicly from one iteration to the next and very clearly the consultation and the feedback. An example of this would be again from the National Forum. This hasn't always happened, but in this case, in the development of the policy, they shared the consultation outcomes. They didn't share the raw data. They did a summary. So you kind of have to trust that their summary was accurate. And then that went along with the, the released second edition, if you like. Um, be very interesting, and sometimes policy um, researchers do use things like the Freedom of Information Act to uncover what was really um, submitted at the time. And then um, I did say some time ago that there are two definitions or two types of policy that Stephen Ball talks about. The second are policy discourses. This is how we go about engaging with the policy, how we go about enacting it and reshaping the policies, because just what's written down in a big P policy doesn't mean it gets implemented in the way that was intended. And all the languages of persuasion that go with the policy. So this is a discourse and discourse analysis is one of the methodologies frequently used alongside content analysis. So um, I'm going to not give you an example right now of policy discourses. I'll do that as part of thinking about how you might do research in this area. So I'm conscious I've taken a very long time talking about what is policy. I've really only scratched the surface, and I hope you get a chance to talk about this a little bit more. But what is the purpose of policy? Seems probably self-evident. You do note that I've got the big P there in the word policy in the title. 
Um, so I'm primarily thinking big P policies and asking that question. You can probably read these for yourself, um, but usually policy emerges where there is a problem. It's intended to address a problem. Um, sometimes, and ideally, what it tries to do is outline that we have choices. What are the policy choices that we face? We try to make it explicit for us, which are the better choices. It can also legitimize a new area or something that's happening. The policy adds that greater weight to it, especially if it's a, a macro level or a meso level policy that's come with input through serious stakeholders. Um, ultimately, usually there's some kind of change intended, a new outcome. Having said that, you know, um, in my experience, it's just as important either as a policy maker, someone who has to implement policy, even as a practitioner, or if you're researching policy, to note where there are emissions of policy. Sometimes you can actually do a lot when there isn't a policy. A policy can sometimes kill off an innovation. So there's a balancing act to be had here. And then there's this distinction in the literature between symbolic policies and, and more transformative policies that are really after that action of some kind of change. A symbolic policy is something that sort of just grandstands a little bit, but it really has no substance and nothing ever arises from the policy. Um, I could think of one right at the top of the head now, but it might be a little too controversial to mention. So you'll have to tease that out or do your own searching around symbolic policies. Um, in my case, I'm actually involved in uh, an analysis right now or a policy project that I've been um, in, contracted by Quality Qualifications Ireland um, to develop a new set of statutory national quality assurance guidelines for providers of blended and online learning. This project has come about because COVID gave Ray or Ro, uh, raised serious concerns around quality quality of online in particular. Previously, these quality assurance guidelines existed for blended learning. So there's a problem perceived and we're working through a process to develop and working through a consultation process to, to refresh the existing guidelines for blended learning and introduce new ones for online learning involving the whole um, higher education as well as further education and vocational education sectors. So this is an example of a policy text that will come out of this work. Another one that I've been involved in um, right now, I would actually go so far as to say that 2022 is the year of the micro-credential. This is a massive in terms of a new area of excitement and development right across Europe. And during 2020, I was part of the high, European Commission's high-level consultation group to develop a European approach to micro-credentials. So this is, again, an example to try to introduce something new, to affect the change, and in this case, on a whole of European basis. And this policy is, or this initial work has now evolved into something that's been accepted right across all EU member states with a clear framework and definition. So those are just two examples of my policy work. It does now beg the question what a good policy looks like um, and how you go about developing and implementing it. Uh, I'm probably going to leave you a good opportunity to talk about that um, with, again, yourselves and, and examples from your own experience. But I will flag um, this question. Can you think of a really good example? Do you have a good example? They're not easy to find, truthfully. Um, it depends what you mean by good. So I'll give a little bit of a hint what might be good, but I've actually given you some examples of or indicators of what might be good, constitute good. In that, I've referred to the importance of the process and transparency around the choices that we face, but it goes a little bit deeper than that. What I would flag to you is two reports that you might want to follow up in this space. European Commission, um, the JRC, which is the research sort of institute or division in this area, produced this report. It's a bit out of date now. It's about five years old, but it did a nice analysis of the various policies across Europe and the state of the play at the time, if you like. So that's a useful document or um, report to be aware of. The second is actually quite an interesting report produced by the National Forum again, um, and this was uh, intended to be helping policy makers 
Now, a policymaker isn't someone sitting um, in Dublin in a boardroom somewhere or in an office dreaming up policy. In many respects, we're all policymakers in some form. We're all contributing, whether it be in our own organization or at a national level. We all have a, a stake in this. But here, they've tried to um, articulate the sort of principles around enabling policies with this digital focus in teaching and learning. Um, the next slide here gives you some of the um, key indicators of good policies. Um, clearly, it's a process. Um, I won't go through all of the things. You can look at this in your own time. The co-creation component, the consultation and collaboration. So it's not something that's done to you when it's a good policy, but you're co-creating that policy. Um, policy alignment is another very important idea where it fits with existing policies. There's not much point having a policy that is an orphan that sits on its own and doesn't connect to all the other types of policies, whether those be big P policies or little P policies. So I encourage you to take a look at, at this report. Um, there are some elements that I would be critical of, and I'm going to probably touch on those when we start peeling away what we really mean by policy and understand um, from a critical perspective and reading policy, some deeper questions. So um, I'll talk about those in a second. It's really linked to why you might want to undertake research on policy. I really hope, as I said earlier, that you are a little excited by policy. I certainly find it a very interesting area because good policy can really be enabling, as the um, report there, as I was sharing with you, indicated. A couple of things that are absolutely crucial that I haven't mentioned to date, and this is really the little bit of critique that I'm adding to the enabling policy um, report from the, the National Forum. All policy is political. Actually, all education is political. I, I guess you should know that at this level uh, now. So uh, there are many different stakeholders and the uh, weight that those stakeholders, the extent of their voice is not always the same. Some are more dominant than others. The policy itself is never neutral. It reflects those dominant voices. Uh, and so we do need to understand policy at this deeper level. In fact, Michael Apple, um, I see a little typo there that I've got uh, in the quote needed to remove one of the brackets. But he argues, given that all education is political, policy involves critical struggles over who's really authority is being exercised on others um, and even the very meaning of education itself, who defines what it is and what the curriculum is, is all about control and dominance. Now, you could take that too far, but this is just to give you a sense that you need to understand that policy is political. It's not neutral. And another reason to remove it from just being critical about policy is the other reason to be researching policy is if we want better policy, then we need to understand how we can produce better policy, what works and why. Um, one interesting study that I've been involved in this year with the OECD, it's similar to the work I'm doing of QQI around quality assurance. So we've been working almost all year looking at national quality assurance agencies around the world and the way in which they've responded to the growth of online digital higher education. Um, and here what we've identified is that in the OECD jurisdiction, um, only three countries or national agencies have actually made a conscious decision that they don't want to have special QA requirements for digital higher education. They've said, we just have QA requirements for higher ed for education. We don't need special ones in addition for um, digital elements of education, whether it be blended online, hybrid, and so forth. So three. 22 haven't done anything, but it's not because they've made a conscious decision not to do anything. They just haven't got to it. And we're a bit speculative, if you like, in reading behind why that might be. There are 13 countries, including Ireland, the example I've shared from the OECD, sorry, from the QQI, who have developed these supplementary guidelines and requirements or standards for online blended development. So looking at how different countries or different jurisdictions have responded to the same problem, we can learn quite a lot from. And in this particular study, we've been working with one European country to radically, very radically overhaul their whole national QA approach. 
Um, but that's an example of betterment by understanding policy. Another thing that's probably worth me sharing with you around the political aspect and, and understanding and reading these policy discourses at a deeper level, not just the policy text. So here's an example of a policy text, big B, a big P. It's the European Digital Education Action Plan. Um, but what most people wouldn't know in the public domain is that um, in supporting this policy, I was involved, and that sounds a little egotistical, not intended. A group of us were involved in producing this particular report that was in designed to inform the establishment of the European Digital Education Hub, which I hope you know about. That shouldn't be new to you. It's a very sizable initiative by the European Commission, multi-million. This particular report, a feasibility report, so it's a small p policy text, was never published. Um, so it's a little bit of annoyance for me because I spent um, a good six months working on this report. It was a very challenging report to work on, but it was never published. So it's an example of where you'd need to use and ask the right question using a, a Freedom of Information Act or equivalent, depending upon which jurisdiction you're operating within. Um, so these policy texts, these small p policy texts can give you insights into the process that was followed and how political that process might be. I won't elaborate more because I'll get myself in hot water if I tell you too much more about that particular experience. So why would you undertake policy research? Um, well, to really peel away, as I've said earlier, whose knowledge this is, how did it become official? In terms of the benefits, um, who really will benefit from it? And importantly, who might not benefit? because that's linked to whose voice is dominant and whose voice is missing. And generally there are missing voices. Um, it's usually people from underrepresented groups, um, even people in, in education who might come with learning disabilities of some kind that are not around the table, many different stakeholders. And then ultimately, what are the hidden effects of a particular policy? because policies are not benign. There are usually these winners and losers. So these are all good reasons to be involved in policy research. Last part, I have no idea how long this has been. Um, first time I've done this. So let's see if we can finish off very briefly by what is, I think, the most important part around being a researcher, a policy researcher, is how do you critically read policies? Well, you need to have a theoretical lens to do so. The trap to fall into in reading a big P policy is just describing it, just describing what the policy is. Maybe you describe the process. That doesn't really add to a lot of new knowledge, truthfully. It doesn't give us insights into what really went on. Analyzing the policy discourses, which is the languages of persuasion, who was involved, what stakeholders were more vocal than others. So this is where you have to look at those small p policy texts in order to get insight, to get some evidence of this. And there are defined methodologies. So this is not something you just do uh, randomly. There are methodologies um, I'm not going to take too long here because you can look this up yourself and I'm sure you have some readings that you probably have been introduced to either in this module or in others around how you do policy. Um, Michael Apple is very well known as one of these critical policy readers, but there are others that I've referred to already. So I just invite you to look at some of the literature if you do want to look more deeply around how you do critical policy um, analyses or critically reading policy. I want to finish with a personal example. If you like, my lens, I referred to that I'm quite actively involved in the area of micro-credentialing. I'm actually out of the island at the moment and recording this in a hotel room. Um, and so the micro-credential area is not neutral. It's driven by some powerful uh, drivers but also some powerful attractors. A driver is something that pushes and an attractor is something that's pulling. There are uh, drivers around employability, upskilling people for the new economy. There are um, attractors around promoting more lifelong learning. 
And then even uh, there's a driver for some institutions. It's all about new money, making um, our macro credentials, our degrees, and unbundling them and selling small units. So it helped me understand the policy discourses. And that's a plural because there's usually not a single discourse, the competing and coexisting discourses. I look at these four lenses that are actually entangled. So it's very hard to unbundle or un untangle them. I won't confuse you using the word unbundling again. And these different perspectives, if you like, use the same language often, but for the different ends. So broadly, I put them into two camps. There are those in a policy sense who are promoting the so-called new knowledge economy. And then there are others who are more anchoring their work and the policy work that they're trying to produce around the noble tradition of the learning society. Um, and within those two um, broad traditions, um, there are two sort of sub-perspectives or lenses. Um, actually, the most dominant lens in all of education is a reproduction one. Education has been highly successful at reproducing one generation to the next. Those with the cultural capital tend to be successful from one generation to the next. Education is a sifting agent. So the reschooling discourse is where micro-credentials are being seen as a way to radically reschool the way we do things. When I'm using the word school here, I'm talking about education more generally, not schools per se. A way of bringing in a more free market approach, a supermarket model with micro-credentials where the learner can choose what they want, bits of what they like. Usually technology here is seen in a very deterministic way as progress. It's a, everyone, technology transformation or digital transformation is seen as progress. It's not seen as something that might be more problematic. Equally, there are some who are promoting micro-credentials similarly in this unbundling as part of de-schooling to challenge the traditional hierarchical structures of education. So they're focusing more on a much more democratic opening up education, providing personalized learning pathways. The problem is a de-schooling discourse plays straight into the hands of those from a neoliberal perspective who want to create a new learning market. So you have de-schooling and reschooling in competition using actually the same language. They're using language of open badges and digital credentials and academic credentials, but for very different purposes. Ultimately, the last quadrant, I've taken a little longer than I intended here. I'm not explaining it as well as I'd like. You have to read this probably because it's not an easy thing to explain quickly. The reconceptualizing discourse is where the micro-credential movement is anchored around equity, inclusion, social justice, uh, sustainable development goals, education for citizenry. But I can tell you, having completed a major literature review on micro-credentials last year for the European Commission, is there is next to no driver or articulation around micro-credentials for those reasons, for particularly around social justice issues and equity and inclusion. So this helps us see what's going on and the entangled discourses, policy discourses, in a better way but it ultimately tells us just how complex the policy environment is. And you need a critical multi-focus lens to be able to zoom in and out at these different policy discourses. I could replace micro-credentials in this a summary of this diagram here, and it could well be some digital education initiative and the same sorts of lens would actually work. Happy to talk more about that for those who really do have an interest in doing policy research in this space. But time to wrap up again with um, what is a very long quote. I'm not going to read this quote to you, but it want, I'm, I'm wanting to leave you with the sense that the last thing you would want to be doing in this space is this descriptive policy analysis. It needs to be very critical. And Kerry Facer as I'm talking, hopefully you're reading, brings this to her work. She also has a very strong focus on, on green technology and, and environmental and social justice issues. 
Uh, as I said, it's a long quote. It's a quote that I cite in a, in a book chapter that's just been published in this new handbook on open distance and digital education, which resonates with my own perspective, asking whose voice is really being heard, whose voice hasn't been heard, and so forth. So I won't, as I said, read the detail of that, but this is really the substance of policy research when you're looking and peeling away the layers within the discourses that are competing and coexisting with one another. Wrapping up, um, probably this is far too long as a video, so I'm not sure whether um, you've kept up with this point, but the one reason at the end why policy is such an interesting area to work with, um, slightly controversial figure to use, I guess, in, in Ireland, but Tony Blair once said, education is the best economic policy there is. And so educational policy can be incredibly powerful to address all of those challenges that we face in our societies for a more fair and equitable and thriving society for all. So I'll stop on that note. Um, I'm just sorry I couldn't be with you in person, but hopefully you can play this video back at some point at leisure. And I hopefully um, we'll hear from some of you at some point if you're interested in doing policy research, because I'm always um, around to provide advice and steer you towards relevant literature. So thanks very much and have a good day.